Last time we spoke about single processor architectures and today we are going to talk about parallel architectures. How we pick up single processor systems and we combine multiple processors together to form parallel architectures. So before we start this, let's have a small activity. So I want each one of you to think of a random number. Determine whether it's odd or even. Okay, now I want you guys to tell me whether there are more odd integers or there are more even integers that you have collectively thought of. It's not a some psychological game or something. <laughs> you have to talk to each other to figure that out. Okay. I want to know the total number of odd and even integers or I want to know whether there are more odd integers or there are more even integers. We need another processor to combine. No, I, I don't need another processor. Come on, you ask. How many processors are sitting here? One thing is we want to come up with different ideas of how to do it and then we actually want to do it. So I would like you guys to first actually do it, then we'll come up with ideas of how to do it. Yeah, you have to communicate with your neighbors. So everybody with uh, who had thought of an odd number, put your hands up. You got it right, okay, good. All right, uh, good. So let's try to jot down uh, the different things that you had to do. You had to communicate. Communicate with who? Okay, communicate with neighbors. So how did you communicate with your neighbor? You just sent him some data, which is essentially whether the number you had thought of was even or odd. What did your neighbor do with that? So who was your neighbor? Okay, what did you, what did you do with that? Your data or your data combined with his data? So you basically did some kind of aggregation. You did some kind of aggregation and then you passed on that information. All right. How did you guys figure out who's your neighbor? Proximity, okay. So what did you guys do? You essentially formed a network, right? What was the shape of this network? How did you guys figure out what is the network you have to form? Well, it was a little bit at random. Was it the most efficient way of forming the network? Probably not. At the end of the day, all the data had to be accumulated at one point. So there was one kind of a leader or root, right, where the data had to be accumulated. Let's touch upon one of these things a little bit more. That is the network. So how many of you were there? There were about 20 students there, right? You formed the network at random, you could solve the problem quickly, fine. But what if we have like 1000 or 100,000 processors trying to solve a problem, let's say trying to do such an aggregation. So what is the network topology that you will use? Can you think of who should communicate with who in such a situation? Make small, small blocks and again make a network. So you're it's kind of like a hierarchical network, right? Okay. So if there are, let's say, n nodes, n processors, if there were n of you, how quickly could you do this? What is the best communication network I can form so that this can happen very quickly? Okay, so this is something called the topology of the network. We'll come back to it. Now let's talk about another situation. So here you were basically exchanging messages with each other, right? It was some kind of message passing where each one of you was passing some message to your neighbor, which was essentially a number, right? So you, there was no shared resource. You did not have some resource in common where you could share information. Instead, you chose to talk to each other, right? But if you have a shared resource, 
let's say that you have a, a blackboard. What does that mean? That means that now anybody can write to the blackboard and anybody else can read from the blackboard, right? And, and let's say you're not talking to each other now because you don't have any mechanism of talking to each other. You only have the blackboard. How do you solve the problem now? Let's say this is the blackboard. So the first question is, is each one of you writing at a different location or at the same location? Same location. Same location. Different location. Okay. <laughs> Good. Differing views, different algorithms, different solutions. Yeah. So how would you uh, solve it if you're writing at different locations? So first of all, all of you are going to come and write down, right? Each one of you comes and writes down processor one. I'm just calling you processors, right? Don't mind. So processor one and comes and writes down one over here. Processor two says my number is even. So I'm going to write a zero, right? We're counting the number of odds. And then processor n comes and writes one. Now, now what do you do? So each one of you has written onto that shared resource, onto the blackboard, that what is the number you have? Now, what do you do? Who's going to do that? All of you will count or one of you will count? Okay. Now that's, is that a very efficient way of doing it? What if you had 100,000 processors? Well, shared resource uh, is, is a very difficult, uh, you know, thing to have in a, when you have 100,000 processors, but still so suppose that you had 100,000 processors, even with eight processors or 16 processors, it becomes a challenge. So it's, it's not the most efficient thing you're doing, right? One processor is going through all the data sequentially, right? So you, you've lost the parallelism. What was good about the message passing thing that you did? What was good about it? It was happening in parallel. While you guys were computing your numbers, these guys were computing their numbers and then it was exchanged, right? Even here, like the front row was calculating it separately, the back row was calculating it separately and so on, right? So everything was happening in parallel. Uh, so here there's a problem, right? You're not doing it in parallel. Sure, everybody is writing it in parallel to the shared resource, but after that, one person is sequentially going through and reading all the numbers and trying to sum it up, right? So, how can you resolve that? So, what you're suggesting is you divide up the processors into groups, P1 and so on, right? up to maybe p root n, I'm, I'm just arbitrarily taking a number, right? You haven't told me what the number is, so I'm just arbitrarily choosing a number. And then p n, so this is going to be uh, root n rows of root n elements each, right? And by doing this, you have brought down the time to how much? How, how many steps do you take now? So one step is in when all of you are writing to the board, right? That's one step because it's happening in parallel. So it's just one step, right? After that, one person in each row goes and adds up all the entries in the row. How much time does that take? Root n step, right? So one plus root n. Now there are root n people, root n leaders of one in each row who has the sum. So what do you do next? So now you need to sum across that, right? So that will be another another root n steps. So total is about two, two root n plus one steps, right? Can you do it even more efficiently? Yeah, you can. So we'll talk about these things later, right? So what are the other challenges that you could possibly have? How does P1 know that P2 through Pn, all of them are done with their counting and so it can start counting now? Either the processors work in a very lockstep manner where, you know, they're all doing everything at the same time. So you know that in the previous cycle, I did the counting, so everybody did the counting. But that's not typically the way these processors work. When the leader wants to do the counting, how does the leader know that all the other processors are done? It asks, okay. How do you ask on the blackboard? How do you ask? Okay, you can allocate a memory location. Whenever um, processor write to it, we will increase by Whenever a processor no, so that's not good. What does that mean? Whenever a processor writes to it, we'll increment it by one. It will 
So how do you increment? Okay, very good. So so this is what we want to talk about. How do you increment a number which is sitting in the memory, which is sitting in the shared resource? You can't just go and tell the blackboard that increment this by one. Where does the incrementing actually happen? Where is the number in, number incremented? In your brain, right? The number is incremented at the processor, not in the memory, right? So how do I uh, increment the number? You read the number, you add one to it, and then you put it back. Okay, so let's say the number was two. So what did you do? You read the number, right? So you got two, you added one, you got three, and then you wrote three back here. What can go wrong? Somebody else may write to that memory location while you're doing this, right? So what do you want to do then? Each each processor has to have its own memory allocation. Uh, but that defeats the purpose of a shared resource. Uh, I can always divide the memory up into n chunks and give it to each of the processors, right? That that's not an issue. That's not a problem. I can do that. I, I won't allow anybody else to write in the other processor's memory space. Not an issue. But then, how do I communicate? My end goal is to communicate without any problem, right? The problem here was not that I had to increment a number. The reason somebody else is overwriting it is because he was trying to communicate something to me, right? I, I wanted that collective number. Otherwise, if, if, if n processors want to increment their own n numbers, not a challenge at all. Each one of them has his own memory. They have the number sitting in their own memory. They go get their numbers incremented by one, store it back. Right? There is no, nobody else is going to come and write to their memory. Right? The, the point here is that there is this one shared location which is shared by all the processors where we are trying to communicate. We are trying to count how many processors have updated the memory, have up updated the number of odd uh, integers that they have. Right? Okay? Yeah, so what do you do? Uh, how do you tell that processor? <laughs> you only have the shared resource, right? The only way you can tell the processor is again going back to the blackboard. You again have to use the blackboard to communicate to tell that processor. There is no other channel that you have to tell that processor. Whenever somebody is writing, it will put a lock. What? Okay. So some kind of rule will be if somebody is writing, don't lock, read and write it. Right. So, what is a lock? A lock is basically you are trying to say that while I am performing this operation, nobody else should be touching this location, right? That is what you are trying to uh, essentially say, right? So you lock the memory location or you, you, you can lock anything you want. You can lock the entire memory, you can, you can choose. This is your algorithm, right? So you can choose what my lock means, right? But essentially you lock uh, whatever is shared, right? where there, there is a problem of conflict, where somebody else may also be uh, writing. So you lock that location and then you do whatever operations you want to do on it and then you unlock it. And while it is locked, nobody else can come and lock it, right? Everybody has to uh, wait for this to be unlocked before they can lock it. Only one person can have a lock at a time, right? Or you are trying to perform an atomic operation. The memory location is not changed while the update is taking place, okay? While all those operations are being completed, Nobody else is coming and touching the memory, right? So you are doing it atomically. Meaning that if the if the thing is locked, then somebody is locking it, and therefore everybody is not done. Uh, no. So between the time that so let's say somebody has locked it, right, and somebody else wants to write something to it, but he has to uh, wait for this to be unlocked so that he can lock it. So for a momentary period between the two locks, it's going to be unlocked for a little while, right? When he unlocks it, before the other guy locks it, it's going to be unlocked in the unlocked state, right? So that cannot be, uh, uh, you know, used to determine whether it's it's uh, finished or not. Okay. Uh, no. So there are architectures which do that. There are vector processors. I mean, let me just give you a gist of it, but we are not going to talk about it in detail, right? So what is a register? A register is 32-bit or a 64-bit or a uh, register uh, location where you are 
storing your data, right? And where you perform the operation. So you pick up, like if you want to add, you take two registers, let's say a register called R1 and a register called R2, and uh, you, you give a command, add and store into R3 the value of the add addition of R1 and R2, right? So what does this do? This picks up the uh, value from register R1, the value from register R2, sends it to the uh, math unit and the result is then stored into a register R3, right? And what is the size of these registers? 32 or 64 depending on what is the word size of that architecture. But it can be used to for performing operations on integers or longs or whatever, right? A lot of architecture support uh, vector operations. So in these, what, what you have is something called vector registers. So these are registers which are like quite long, right? So these are like instead of, let's say 32 bit, they are 32 into 4, 128 bit. And these registers can actually store four values, right? V1, V2, V3, V4. These are four different values. They are storing these four different values. And now you, you can do the same thing on these, on these registers, right? So all, all of these operations are essentially performed synchronously, exactly in the same cycle, right? They go through the math unit, all of them proceeding lockstep and doing exactly the same thing in each step, okay? In this course, we will assume that the processes are working independently on their own. 